we've been asking ourselves over recent weeks the question, who is Jesus? And as we've asked that question, we first of all asked that question of the Old Testament scriptures. What did the Old Testament scriptures say in answer to the question, who is Jesus? And we spent a couple of weeks looking at that question before we spent another couple of weeks uh, looking at the question, what do the narratives of Jesus' birth tell us about who Jesus is? And I want us to come this morning to ask that question of Jesus himself. Who did Jesus think he was? Now, in a sense, perhaps that's one of the most important questions of all to ask. Who did Jesus think he was? And I want us to notice a number of things that he taught that indicate who he considered himself to be. Now, you can remember that story, uh, can't you, when at the age of 12 years, Jesus went up with his family to the temple and uh, he got lost and uh, Mum and Dad eventually uh, went to find him uh, and uh, there he was in the temple speaking to the leaders of the Jewish religious nation. And uh, when Mary says to Jesus, your mother and I, uh, your father and I have been looking for you, without I think being rude, Jesus replies by saying uh, that it was appropriate for him to be in his Father's house. Now I've given you the reference on the notes. So that Jesus, confronted by Mary referring to his earthly father, refers to the fact that there is another father that is his. Uh, and he's in his father's house. Now that's very interesting. If you go into the Old Testament, and I'm not going to look up all the references this morning, you can you can do that when you go home, uh, if you so wish. When you go back into the Old Testament, the book of the Psalms, for example, you find that the Old Testament could speak of God being the father of his people. A father to the fatherless. But especially when it looked to the coming of the Messiah, it refers to him as especially uh, having a, spe a special relationship uh, to God which can be described in terms of fatherhood. So if you look at Psalm 89, or if you're happy for me to refer it to you, in Psalm 89 and in verse 26 we're told this, of the one who is the Messiah, he will call out to me, you are my Father, my God, the Rock, my Saviour. So, Jesus claims that God is his Father. And he seems to claim Jesus, God as his Father in a particularly exclusive way which is consistent with that Old Testament testimony. So the Old Testament said God is the father of all his people, but he is especially going to be the father of the coming Messiah. A Jesus says he is in his father's house, and then as he enters his ministry years later, the same distinction uh, is present. Jesus encouraged his disciples and encourages us to pray as we have done so this morning. Our Father who is in heaven. And uh, there is the hint there that we can, each one of us, address God as my Father. And yet Jesus always preserved a distinction between our experience of God's fatherhood and his. In John's Gospel, for example, after the uh, resurrection, he speaks to the disciples and he says, I am going to your father and my father, your God 
and my God. If you read through John's Gospel, you'll fi in particular, you'll find a number of references in which Jesus seems to claim a special relationship <coughs> with the Father. And it appears that right from the earliest years we're told about Jesus' life, uh, he, he was aware that he had a special relationship with God that could be described in terms of God being his father. But Jesus also used the Old Testament testimonies about the Messiah, the coming promised one, and he applied those to himself too. But I want you to notice in a few minutes how he did that, but he put a unique twist on it. Uh, he redefined what the mes Messiah would be. There were expectations uh, at the time about what the Messiah would be like, what he would do. Jesus redefined them to explain the nature of the messiahship that was his. You remember that occasion when very early on in his ministry, perhaps on one of the first few days of his ministry, he went into the uh, synagogue at uh, Nazareth, his hometown, and the script, he was invited to read the scriptures. And he opened the scroll of Isaiah. The reference, you'll find it, uh, is, is to be found in Luke's Gospel and chapter 4, he took the scroll of uh, Isaiah and he read it. And we're told this, he read, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the, for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of God the Lord's favour. Now if you look, at the little footnote that comes after that, it has a little letter E and it refers you to the bottom of the page where it, where it tells you that this is a quotation of Isaiah chapter 61. One of the chapters in the Old Testament that was seen to point forward to this coming person. Now listen to what Jesus said when he's read this out. Read this out. We're told in verse 20, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And you can sense the pregnant pause. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your healing, in your hearing. So Jesus has taken one of the messianic passages and he has said, it applies to me. And he does this on other occasions. Uh, quite often he seems to take ideas relating to uh, the Messiah and apply them to himself. We can't look up uh, any more than perhaps one this morning. But in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 17 uh, is one of these passages. Matthew says, Jesus went about doing these various things and he says, then says, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. Now again, you'll notice there's a little note that points you down to the bottom to what you already knew. This is a reference to Isaiah 53. And Matthew is telling us, when Jesus went about his ministry, uh, he sought to model his ministry upon those passages in the Old Testament that spoke of the coming Messiah. Indeed, elsewhere, he was more than ready to accept messianic titles when they were given to him. We've already seen that in our reading this morning. You are the Christ, says Peter. And Jesus doesn't deny it. You're the Messiah. Well, yes, I am. You remember those two blind men outside the uh, gates of Jericho who say, 
Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon us. Son of David was another of the messianic phrases. Son of David, have mercy upon us. And Jesus doesn't deny what they're saying. But I want you to notice that the unique way that I already hinted at that Jesus takes those messianic expectations. I've already hinted at the fact that Matthew <coughs> thought that Jesus modelled his ministry on what are known as the, as the servant songs in Isaiah. There are a number of passages in Isaiah, the most famous of which is Isaiah 53, which speak of a coming servant, a suffering servant. And when Jesus seeks to define what it means to be the Messiah, as against all the nationalistic expectations of the Jews of the time, he takes those passages in Isaiah and he says, now I want you to understand what it means to be a, the Messiah. To be God's Messiah means that I need to fulfil those things that are said in the, in the servant songs, and especially Isaiah 53, to myself. And because of that, he understood that his ministry would be one in which he would suffer and die. In Mark chapter 10, verse uh, 45, he makes that clear. For even, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, there are echoes there again of Isaiah 53. And in a sense you have the same in that passage that we read this morning. When, G when, when Peter declares he's the Messiah, Jesus says, now Peter, I don't want you to tell anybody about that. Now that sounds a bit strange, doesn't it, to us? This is the best news that the world has ever heard, that Jesus is the coming Messiah. And Jesus says, don't tell anyone. But he then explains, so it appears to me, why Peter is not to tell anyone. Because Peter does not yet understand what that means. So when Peter rebuked him, uh, no, Peter rebuked him, why did he rebuke him? Because Jesus said, the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. After three days, rise again. Jesus didn't like that notion of the Messiah. It wasn't in his uh, definition of Messiahship. But actually from this point on, in Mark's Gospel in particular, almost every time that Jesus had speaks to his disciples, he speaks about the fact that he's going to suffer and die a ransom for many. So while Jesus was happy to acknowledge he was the Messiah, uh, he insisted that those who believed him to be so, understood that messiahship in the terms of the servant songs. Uh, that he had come to, to seek and to save the lost through suffering and death as a ransom price. Now just a couple of other things briefly in closing this morning on this. One of the interesting things in the Gospels is that when, although Jesus does acknowledge that these things that we've already looked at, does seek to redefine what Messiahship means, when he speaks of himself, his preferred title for himself is the Son of Man. You think of the occasions when you've read through the Gospels. How often it is that Jesus speaks about the Son of Man? There's at least 40 occasions in which Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man in the Gospels. He'll occasionally refer to himself as other things, but over 40 times, 
as the Son of Man. When Jesus sought to define himself and speak to others about himself, he called himself the Son of Man. An interesting question, at least to me, to ask the question, why? Well, you know, that phrase, the Son of Man, is found in the book of Daniel. In chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14. And perhaps it's appropriate if I just uh, turn over to that passage uh, and um, read it to you. Daniel chapter 12, verses... Um, uh, sorry, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, that's clearly referring to the Messiah again. But it's not a term that was picked up and used in the current discussions about the Messiah. So Jesus picks up this particular phrase it's not often used and he uses this one and I think he does it to encourage people to reflect upon who he really is it enabled him to fill up what he was trying to explain about his ministry uh, with content that was his content rather than the assumptions of others it preserves of course the idea that he's a human being son of man but it's linked with messianic expectations it's linked to in that Daniel passage with his free access into the very presence of God and it's that that's interesting because it points to something else and the final thing I want to draw your attention to about Jesus' understanding of himself when push comes to shove Jesus clearly believed himself to be God in Mark chapter 2 verses 1 to 12 you remember that lovely passage I always remember this from when I was a kid it must, I think we had a study Bible which had pictures in and one of the pictures in my, my study Bible I remember uh, my children's Bible was of these men clearing away the taking away the roof and letting uh, this paralysed man down through the roof into the presence of Jesus now we all know the story I think and in Mark chapter, tw uh, chapter 2 uh, it's recorded to us uh, and Jesus says to this man your sins are forgiven you now we're so familiar with the story well of course Jesus did that but actually when he said it the people around were scandalised and all the pompous theologians that were, sta were, were present said but only God can forgive sins and they were absolutely right their theology was absolutely correct what they didn't do was apply it to the current situation they refuse to acknowledge that it could be possible that the one who is speaking in, in uh, speaking words of forgiveness was himself God. But clearly, Jesus is bringing this confrontation with these leaders about in order to make a claim to be God. Right at the beginning of his ministry, uh, he makes that claim. And you could find other similar claims throughout the Gospels. Uh, and, and perhaps the most obvious one is the repeated statements that Jesus makes in John's Gospel, I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. Now what's very interesting in the Greek New Testament uh, is that what Jesus says there is... is though he would have spoken in Aramaic, uh, is expressed in a little phrase 
which in, in Greek is ego eimi. I am. Ego eimi translates a phrase way back in the book of Exodus where Moses asks God who he is. And Moses says, I am, has spoken to you. So that John, in recording Jesus' words, indicates that when he was speaking to his disciples in particular, he used a phrase relating to himself that included within it the very name of God. And of course, then said those things that could only be true of God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection. So Jesus clearly understood as he as he reflected, I would suggest, in the light of the scriptures as a young man as a, and as he grew uh, and asked those questions, who then am I? He came to understand who he was. That he was the incarnate Son of God. Sent into this world to be the ransom-paying Messiah of God. Now why is this important? Well it's important for, for at least two reasons and with this I close. The first reason is this um, that the world out there is sometimes prepared to acknowledge that Jesus was a great man a great moral teacher, a great this or that, Islam is willing to recognize Jesus as a prophet. That's all very well, but it doesn't take seriously what Jesus actually said about himself. He does not claim to be a prophet. He claims to be God incarnate. He doesn't claim to be a great moral teacher, though he was that. He, he claims to be the Son of God. And I'm not sure, I would, I would take very seriously the words of anyone as a moral teacher or as a prophet if they were apparently so much a megalomaniac as to claim to be God incarnate. The world out there needs to face the claims of Jesus, Jesus' own claims rather than their edited version of what they would like him to be, which actually becomes something quite different than the person that is revealed in Scripture and concerning whom the testimony is given. But the other, perhaps more important point for us, is this, isn't it? If God, in the person of his Son, has entered into our world, uh, if he has drawn into himself all the promises and expectations of the Old Testament scriptures, if he claims to be the Messiah of God, the spokesperson of God, we should listen to him. And when he says he has come to give his life a ransom, we need to take seriously what that implies about our need and, what he has and how he has come to meet it. The Bible tells us that we're all of sin and come short of the glory of God. But it also tells us that when he speaks of himself as being the ransom it is that, that those sins might be washed away, that we might be restored to fellowship with God and we might be among that that innumerable host of which we've read in Daniel chapter 7 uh, who com comprise his people at the day when he returns on the clouds of heaven. Let's pray together.
Father, it's not a question we often ask, who, is, who did Jesus think he was? Yet it's a relevant question. It's an important question. And it's a profoundly challenging question when we hear what he says of himself. And so we stand today before one who is the incarnate Son of God. We stand before one who came to be a ransom for many, to suffer death and arise again that he might be our saviour. And we thank you that he will come again with the clouds of heaven and that he will then establish his rule in such a way that none will be able to uh, speak against him or deny who he is so thank you for your word this morning we pray help us to apply it to our own uh, lives and our own testimony for we ask it for his sake amen